On this episode of the Ask Mike Reinald Show, we talk about how we choose some of the PT interventions that we do when there isn't enough scientific evidence available. The Ask Mike Reinald Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to make sure you knew about my free online course on the introduction to performance therapy and training. If you want to learn how to get started optimizing and enhancing performance, this is the course for you. Head to MikeReynolds.com slash performance to sign up today. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show. I am here with the crew at Champion PT and Performance, Dan Pope, Lenny Macrina, Dave Tilly, Mike Scaduto. Is that your signature? <laughs> Mike likes to do the thumbs. Dave stretches his hamstring for some reason. It's not even a stretch. I, I, very, yeah, exactly. It just worked out a little sore. <laughs> Perfect. We are here answering your amazing questions. Uh, we are super appreciative of you guys. <laughs> I'm trying to be nicer after last episode. Uh, but no, we're super appreciative of all the great questions. Uh, answering all your great PT, fitness, sports performance, anything you guys want to talk about, uh, we're here for you. Um, so still, heck, we're, I was trying to look at the episodes and we're getting close to 200. Mm-hmm. You know, we kind of talked, we're getting close. We almost have to do like a 200 party. Mm. We get like a cake or something like that. Streamers, um, good free though. We get, yeah, we're pretty good. But if you think about it, like that's like four years. Does yeah. it seem like we've been doing Started this? just after I joined four years. That's crazy, right? Just so before, it's, it's been a long time. So anyway, but thank you for all of our listeners slash watchers, however you consume this. Uh, we, we totally appreciate it. Len, would you like to do the student intros today? I would love to, uh, Mike. Um, we, we've been having, like, Evan's been here forever now. He's been here for what, three, four for weeks? weeks. Yeah, weeks. So it's great to get to know Evan. Evan Jerjevic from Trine. Trine University in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I was in Fort Wayne, Indiana a couple of years ago. It's a beautiful, beautiful section of Indiana. Um, Evan played college baseball? I did. College, where did you play college baseball? Carson Newman University. Carson Newman University. Carson Newman? Carson, Carson Newman? Carson Newman. Carson Newman. Carson Newman. <laughs> um, and we also have Trey, Trey Martin, Dr. Trey Martin from East Tennessee State University. Is Carson Newman near East Tennessee? <laughs> yeah. Very close, about Very an hour close. and a half. Do you guys know each other? We played against each other, I think, in undergrad. Come Come on. I think. Yeah. Come on. I don't know. This is news. This is breaking yeah. news right now, people. I feel like you could figure this out really quick. Why, are you, right. why do you not know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. I went to Trebekah for I mean, you're not going to remember him, but you remember playing. Play. Yeah, we played Carson Newman, so I don't know if he was Let's there or not. cross-reference Well, just, just say schedule. the year, and then he'll... <laughs> if you tell him the year, <laughs> then, yeah, was there. then you'll both know. <laughs> like 2014, 2015, somewhere in there? It'd be, yeah, 2015. I, I had a long concussion that year. It was weird. I don't I, know. Now it's making sense. Still dealing with symptoms, I think. Who else, Len? Who else? And we also have Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson from Winston State University. I got nothing. Ryan's name is boring. Uh, the school. <laughs> Hopefully your parents don't watch it. So yeah. I mean, we, we love him. He, he's been like amazing all these ball weeks. Ball but. Good job. Uh, Ryan Johnson. <laughs> Ryan Johnson. Trey, are you the question asker today? I am. Fantastic. Yeah. What, what do we got today, Trey? David from San Francisco. How do you determine which PT interventions you perform when there is little to no evidence available? Ooh, good question. Whoa. That's a big one. Yeah. yeah so, I, and it's funny. Like, I kind of got the sense reading the question a little bit too. You know, this is one of the biggest things I'm seeing on social media right now. It's not the post. It's the reactions to the post on how confused everybody is. I'm confused how, with that question. How, how like overwhelmed it is. You don't get the question. No, I mean, I can, no, I mean, you know what to say. Well, so like, <laughs> like, how do you choose what interventions you do right. when we don't have evidence on everything? Right. So, I, I, I'll start off by by saying a lot of people do have this quest to only do things that have strict evidence based. Uh, validity, right? So something that has been shown in a research project to be, you know, valid, for example. Um, and everybody has the quest to do that. And I think that's a, a great quest, right? That you should try to do that all the time. But I think the reality of it, especially in our field, especially in healthcare, especially with the way our clinical trials work, it's nearly impossible to do a well-controlled study on the majority of things we do. So even though like we're trying and we're doing our best with research, it's really hard to conduct these studies. So you know, oftentimes we're faced with things where maybe it's a new technique or intervention that people are talking about on the internet, or maybe it's something that's old but we still haven't validated in there. How do we decide what we do and don't use in our clinical practice? Who wants to start? 
I will just give a broad overview and saying I've always tried to approach it that like 85% of what I'm doing in the clinic is what's available up to this point in evidence-based research from mentors of mine or things I'm reading or good RCTs or whatever. And then 15%, you want to be somewhat creative and innovative and have new ideas in mind. Like I remember when blood flow was first coming, uh, coming popular, I didn't really know a lot about it, but I knew I wanted to at least like try a little bit on myself and like play around with a couple of patients who were like pretty safe. And then from there, the research flows and you're okay. That becomes part of your 85% as the research gets better. But you definitely should be investing almost all of your time in things we know that are pretty solid scientifically. Right, so 85% of your time, but I'm gonna say 85% of what you do is probably not validated through science. Yeah, well I guess theoretically, I would say. It's not like an RCT in double blind controls, but at least like the sciences, like the histology studies are there, the rat models are there, the well, something science. is available that helps you out. I, I'll give you that because that is how we determine a lot of like what we do is, it's, but it's, that's, that, people are gonna argue that that's not scientific, Definitely better than just swinging at nothing. Exactly. So, so I think that's a good start. Is like a lot of what we do, and like a lot of our protocols that we write for after a surgical procedure are based on some of the understanding of, of tissue, right, mm -hmm. and understanding of physiology and how things heal. So we may not know that this is effective at that, but then we we have a theory based on some of our basic science that does it. So I actually think that's that's a good approach. A lot of people are going to argue that that's not valid. The the social media people that are that are uh, uh, nope there isn't a trial that says that's good even if you maybe have like a basic science theory as to why yeah. and i would say that if you if you get really honest with yourself and you're examining what you're doing and how much it, like elite level evidence there is you're gonna have very little to do in the clinic that, I, and i think that's the main point here so dave i think has a great first strategy right there is if we don't have pure evidence on it then we base it as much as we can on our on theories based on what we understand of the basic science mm -hmm. right so that's a good first strategy right there is is we do our best understanding things that's why like we do emg studies right and a lot of people critique emg studies you know for various reasons and rightfully so to an extent but again it's like we're never gonna know if exercise a is the best exercise for this intervention right but we base it on as much sound scientific principles as we can dan yeah i was just gonna say that um and you know it would help if um who was asking the question uh david David gave us some better information uh, about the specific person in front of him or you know, what kind of intervention to try. And, uh, but I can definitely see this. I work with so many fitness people, and a lot of times I get jealous of, like, let's say, baseball players or maybe even runners. There's quite a bit of research on how to treat those problems. You know? right. But if I have someone who has like impingement, rotator cuff tendinopathy, and all the available evidence, uh, evidence is in six-year-old individuals that don't do any sort of fitness activity, and I got like a 23-year-old that wants to like bench press 400 pounds, it's very challenging, right? right? And there's no research out there about people who want to bench press 400 pounds, you know, that have shoulder impingement. There's some, some research there, but very, very little. It becomes very challenging. And uh, one of the things I've borrowed a lot from you guys is that there is some available evidence for baseball players. You guys have done a lot of that, and we can extrapolate a little bit from other populations that are kind of athletic, right? right. So a lot of what I do is taking prior research studies. So one good example is patellofemoral pain syndrome in runners, right? Or let's say like field sport athletes. I apply a lot of those principles of rehab to my athletes who are squatting. They're not running, but they have patellofemoral pain from squatting. So we can extrapolate at least a little bit from that perspective. You know, I like that. Yeah, so so thing. so taking the basic science, right, and then maybe taking a similar population or a similar pathology or something. I think these are good strategies, right? Because again, I think a lot of the students and new grads are saying like, well. I want to know if this exercise is good for shoulder impingement in this person, right? And I, I think this is, you know, Dan taking like maybe from other sources or from other pathologies and applying that, right? Like if we have a study on tendinopathy in the knee, right, maybe we can apply that to tendinopathy in the shoulder, for example, without having a definitive study, right? Who else? Anyone else? Me here. I kind of want to hear what Mike said, so go ahead, but uh, he's like brand new out of school, so I feel like he's... There's be... so many variables to try to no, consider, and, and <laughs> 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 there's yeah, so you're... many... When you do it, you sit, <laughs> sit down and try to do a research study, right? Let's just go That's basic. Me. So Mike and I have done a bunch of research on, especially baseball, but various topics, and when you're trying to cope with inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria and all the variables that could be affecting the independent and de dependent variables, nearly impossible to control for everything. Yeah. So if you're trying to conduct basic research and trying to extrapolate that to people who have emotions and stresses and everything else, 
you throw everything out the window. You just you gotta you gotta be able to interpret it, and then you throw it at the wall and see what sticks with your patient population. And if it works, great. Uh, I think it just comes down to movement and education and being you know good to people. I think that usually is gonna hit ninety nine percent of there it is. Of, of, of <laughs> education. <laughs> get the move, move educate. I'm just get, being get nice. the moving. Like whether, person, whether it's like, like move, so be, be, being good to people, get uh, them moving comfortably, and then. And Magic. then, and then, educating on why we think that that helped and how they have hoped. I, you know, and it's funny. I, I well, Mike, Mike graduated to, last Mike, week. Mike, so. Mike, <laughs> sorry, Mike, Mike's been a therapist for several years now. But uh, Mike, any thoughts? And then now that uh, Dave's throwing you into the fire, <laughs> did you get your certificate yet? Yeah, like, I look, I look a little younger. <laughs> Shaved, yeah. did. Um, no, I mean, if I'm if I'm considering a new intervention and I don't have the years of, of clinical experience, I only have like a week or two um, to, <laughs> to go back on it. So I, I guess I. I look at it like is there a major safety concern so something like is there going to be like a, an ethical issue if i use this on my patient if not i'll go to the best available evidence just kind of look at what evidence is there um, how we can utilize it and if there is limited evidence then you have to go um, based on the experience that you have or you have to consult with somebody and ask their opinion on it who has more clinical experience so for blood flow restriction, for example, which is relatively new, a couple of years old in the literature, I guess, or we've been using clinically, um, we've been using it for a little while. And I kind of like asked you guys like, what, what your opinion on it is, like what's some of the science, you kind of take a step back. So I think it doesn't have to necessarily be one study that um, says this is the best intervention for X. I think you can use a couple different resources to kind of like uh, form your opinion on it. And then you can try it. And form your own um, experience with that modality, if it's a modality, and you can see if it works for your population. I, I think that's, that's kind of great. the only way to do it. I, I, it's a great approach, too, because I don't know how else you do it. I mean, there's <laughs> there's so much gray out there. So, you know, I always call it, like, the light system. I call it, like, a red light system, right? But essentially, like, if there's a, if there is a trial that shows that you what you want to do is ineffective, and, and in a, it shows ineffective, not lack of conclusion, but ineffective, then you shouldn't do it. There's a trial that shows that it is effective, then you should do it. But 85% using Dave's number or something, it's all going to be in the middle, and you're going to have to like play with that a little bit. But one thing I want to cautious everybody, maybe we'll end the episode on this. One thing I want to cautious you on is that a lack of a conclusion does not show ineffectiveness, and I think that's one of the things that we're struggling with right now, especially on social media. Because I'm not kidding, we're seeing things like systematic reviews that show that like manual therapy doesn't work for shoulder pain. But what does that mean? Right? What is? Well, how do you define manual therapy? Who did the manual therapy? What type of manual therapy? Were they all the same experienced person? Was this like this? There, you, you combine all these studies on manual therapy, but how do you define that? And then how do you define shoulder pain? And then what was the diagnosis? The right patient population? I, I, I just wrote an article. I think it was the impingement article, but I did, I did a systematic. I showed a systematic review. I think that the patient population ranged from 25 to 68. That's absurd. That's absurd. So of course the conclusion is is going to be it's inconclusive that they couldn't find anything. It's so diluted of a study that you're not going to find anything. So a lack of con a conclusion, right? So inconclusiveness does not mean it's ineffective. And I think that is where the majority of young clinicians are struggling the most right now is that they're getting confused by a systematic review or a meta-analysis or whatever that may show that there is a lack of findings. And it's and then they're saying then that it must must not be effective. That's not what that study says. It either didn't have the right power, or it didn't have enough control, or it's too diverse of a patient population for the subjects in that study, right? I mean, but I mean, like you guys agree, right? Yeah, makes sense. I mean, so we're seeing that quite a bit, and then people are saying, well, that's, well, manual therapy doesn't work for shoulder pain, and whoa, there's like lots of complications in that. So I'm not saying, you know, pro manual therapy or anything, I'm just saying that studies like that are not helpful, and a lot of people are taking that to the wrong end point, if that makes sense. Okay, so keep that in mind, and I think that's what you do. You do your best. Mike, I think, laid it out really well. Everybody has some good stuff. Dan, you want to add to that? One thing I will say, and uh, I know we don't want to drown off for too long, but I think when people are so evidence-based, they stop critically thinking. And the problem is that we got to use our brains to figure out why this person got hurt, and you can also use your brain to figure out how to get better based on the principles you know as a therapist. And when you're always looking at literature and you're not doing anything that's not evidence-based, I think we lack the ability to use our brains at that point. We're not actually utilizing all of our critical reasoning skills to get that person better when, you know, evidence helps with that process. It shouldn't hinder you. Yeah, yes. evidence has to drive us, but you also can't be paralyzed by a lack of evidence. Yeah. 
I think that's like the, the biggest take home. So awesome. So great episode. Another good question. I think a lot of people have that question. I think that's a pretty common thing. So good one. Uh, we really appreciate it. David, right? David, we appreciate that one. Uh, if you have a question like that, you can head to MikeRinald.com, click on the podcast link and fill out the form to ask us more questions and we will try to answer it on a future episode.